We want to thank you all for being here today and such a great topic to launch our um, focus, joint focus within the uh, dental space and to make sense of why that is for more of. Uh, as we're working with 300 dental students at UF with the educational series through our HELPS program, and uh, we want to make sure everybody understands why that is and how it's important in the overall uh, integrated health care of a patient and the uh, uh, greatest outcome. So today's uh, sponsor, I want to recognize Oberman Law Firm, uh, Stuart Oberman. We want to thank him for making uh, this uh, happen and sponsor your breakfast and that we're able to uh, have this room and uh, have this meeting today. So thank you, Stuart, uh, for, for, for your sponsorship today. So um, today, uh, the focus is, is uh, on the differences of a dental practice versus a medical practice, legal-wise, liability-wise, um, and then look at to say what is the need for the two to coordinate care with the same patient and maybe how that doesn't happen as it should uh, and give some great examples of how it is and how well uh, some of the outcomes are. So we've got a great panel for you today. Uh, very excited. Please think of some good questions. This is meant to be an interactive presentation. That's why we've got so many on the panel to answer questions and uh, make some great points. And then we're going to share this with the uh, dental and medical students because of how important this is. Because that's really where it needs to begin, right? So um, so well, let me introduce our panel. Uh, first of all, we have Stuart Oberman, who is the founder and president of Oberman Law Firm. He is, was gracious enough to come down from Georgia, believe it or not. Uh, seeing the value of what we do here uh, education-wise and working with the students for the greater good. Uh, he graduated from uh, Urbana University, received his law degree from uh, John Marshall Law School. He's been practicing for 24 years. He uh, represents dental clients throughout the United States in a wide range of uh, legal and compliant areas. He, I, know, I know he works with a lot of universities and he does a lot of speaking engagements. He's a frequent lec uh, lec lecturer and publisher of articles in the U.S. in U.S. and Canada. So, uh, welcome, Stuart. Again, thank, thank you for uh, coming and supporting discussions today. Uh, our next uh, speaker will be uh, Debbie Carr. She is a uh, CEO of DK Carr and Associates LLC, she, uh, which is a technology systems and security consulting firm. Uh, she has uh, 22 over 22 years plus of dental uh, practice uh, management experience. Over 30 years experience in technology and security. Uh, she has assisted uh, dentists in obtaining and maintaining their HIPAA high-tech compliance, which I hear is important these days, right? <laughs> First, to understand why this is important to a practice. So, uh, holds several healthcare and IT certifications and membership. Uh, as far as our uh, physician and dental panel, that is going to help to uh, reiterate, say, in their experience, why this is important, what their experience has been, what the patient outcomes have been. Uh, we, we've invited a panel of doctors and dentists, okay? Uh, Dr. Richard jo uh, Joseph Richardson, uh, DMDMS, is president of Richardson Periodontics and Implant Den uh, Dentistry. He attended uh, Wichita State University and University of Florida College of Dentistry. He's active in the Florida Dental Association, a delegate to the FDA from the Lake County Dental Association, and is a professor at uh, UFCD. So welcome, Dr. Richardson. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Pam Trout attended University of Miami at the, uni and, uh, the University of Kentucky Medical School. She's president of Doc Pam, Pediatric and Adolescent uh, Medicine. On the medical advisory board for Blue Horizons Eating Disorder Services, uh, board of directors for Orange County Medical Society in 2015, member of Association of Eating Disorders since 2013, and recently, this is great, recently won Gold Daisy Award for Best Pedi Pediatricians in Orlando in 2016. So congratulations, that's phenomenal. Congratulations. And then. And then our uh, last panelist is uh, Dr. Shaw, Dr. Malik Shaw, uh, should be known by Mo. <laughs> so when you speak to him, please call him Mo. Uh, 
he's an internist and medical genet geneticist, director of the Clinic for Genetic uh, Medicine, graduate of a medical college in Virginia, completed his PhD at the Medical College of Virginia, and a faculty member of the University of Florida. Welcome, Dr. Shaw. Welcome, Walt. <laughs> Thank you. So you see, we've, we've got a great panel of experts from both sides, from the healthcare business professional side as well as the practitioner side to talk about this great topic. Uh, when Chuck and I searched the internet, we did not find, really, we did not find educational series upon why this is important to integrative medicine uh, between dental and medical practices. So with that, I'm going to allow our speakers to start the meeting. Thank you very much. Good morning. I guess I'm first. Um, according to the CDC, we have over 319 million in the United States. Out of those, one in every four um, deaths are, are directly related to heart disease. 9.3% of the population have diabetes, 1.9% has kidney disease, 8.5% cancer, and 55% of, of people over the age of 50 will have some form of osteoporosis. These are conditions that the dentist sees in their chair every single day. In 2012, the CDC ran a study and they found that one out of every two individuals in the United States over the age of 30 has some form of periodontal disease. Periodontal disease is a infection in the oral cavity. It is the number one reason why, and I'm sure that Dr. Richardson can tell you a lot more than I can, um, it is the number one reason why people lose their teeth. It is not due to cavities, it is due to loss of bone, holding those teeth in. Um, clinical study after clinical study shows the bidirectional um, link between missing teeth and periodontal disease. Um, in uh, 2009, I think it was, Harvard, study, Harvard did a study and found that 65% of males not treated with period disease, not treated properly, would develop pancreatic cancer. Just last year, or this year, um, they found that, and, we, and periodontists have known this for years, there's a systemic link between glass, the glycemic levels and scaling and root planing, or osseous surgery, which is the reduction of, of pockets or infection in the mouth. Everyone's aware of HIPAA in the healthcare space. Then we had high tech, which came into play in 2009. What most people are in the dental field are not familiar with is a term called meaningful use. And the purpose of meaningful use was to integrate care um, amongst the healthcare community. Um, the only state that we see meaningful use in today, to date right now is, is Minnesota. They enacted um, meaningful use February, or January 1st of 2015. So if you are a dentist or, a, or an OMS, which is oral maxillary, or a private practitioner or a hospital in the state of Minnesota, you must meet, meet meaningful use. The purpose of meaningful use was to use an electronic health record or medical record to improve the quality, safety, and um, efficiency of health care. It was to also engage the patient and family, improve care coordination, and this is where the link between dentistry and medical is so vital because anybody who's having um, heart surgery or knee replacement or hip replacement, these are standard procedures in the medical community, but they should be going, sending those patients to the dentist to get clearance before they do those procedures because this is infection. And if they had infection anywhere else in the body, they would say, oh wait, we can't do that surgery quite yet. But because they're not looking at this, they go on and do the surgery. Um, so the idea is to improve patient health care and of course maintain the security and privacy of, of health care. The, the goal is to bring interoperability into the healthcare space. And, and the medical community is seeing interoperability where they can go in and they can check labs. If they're in a private practitioner, they can go check Quest Labs and, and get their lab results, or they can see what procedures were done at the hospital. In dentistry, the only area that we really see that interoperability is through DICOM, through our imaging. Um, we know that a dentist take an um, x-ray or radiograph called a panorex, 
panor panoramic or panorex. We know that when it's taken properly, the um, doctors can see the carotid artery. They can see whether it's clogged. That's happened on more than one occasion. I ran a perio office for over 22 years. I've seen my doctor refer to a cardiologist because someone's blood pressure was elevated in the, um, in the chair. And they hadn't been to a, a, a physician in years, but they came to our office because they had a toothache or um, the glycemic levels, because they, we ask questions. We ask their medical history. And the, and the dentist can see the results of issues in the mouth without even asking. They can, they can tell you if somebody smokes. Because meaningful use, you have to ask if somebody smokes in the medical community, right? Dentists can tell you that without even asking. They know just by looking in the mouth. So the goal of interoperability is to increase and to enhance the coordination of care between doctors and between healthcare. Dentists need to pay a vital part in that, um, in that speech and in that talk. ADA got asked to the table only in 2013. Um, dentistry is being moved into the medical model under Obamacare or under the um, Affordable Health Care. Dentists are now required, it used to be we would opt out. Dentists are in the business of saving teeth, so we would opt out of the Medicare um, or the um, CMS. Uh, we would not accept Medicaid, Medicare or Medicaid. Now we're being asked to complete a 8550, which allows the dentist to be an ordering and referring physician, which is vital in the healthcare because the, the dentist does refer to the cardiologist, the endocrinologist, or even just a, a general uh, practitioner because we, we see things, they, the doctors see things in their chairs. Um, but if they're not, if they haven't filled out that 8550, they're not going to be able to um, do prescriptions for their patients. So they're being able, having to, um, being forced to do that. We're also seeing where when uh, simple extractions, the um, green thing is an EOB from Delta Dental. It was for what we call a 7140, which in the dental field, we know that that is just a basic extraction. Um, we had to send it to medical before we can send it to dental insurance. We're starting to see where more medical, more of our procedures are having to go to medical first. In October 1st of 2015, ICD-10 was released. Prior to ICD-10, the only dental um, codes that you saw in ICD-10 was an exam, a, a PA, a Panorex, a, um, extraction, and one denture in a lifetime unless you were a pedi um, pediatric patient. Now, everything we do in dentistry is in ICD-10. We are in the K-series in the um, oral, um, no, digestive system. So the goal is to br start bringing, pa bringing patients, they don't even want to call us patients anymore, it's persons, into the medical um, field. So that's it for me. That's it? That's wow. it. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Any questions? I, I got a lot. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk afterwards. Okay. <laughs> Um, I, I've got two topics, and really, in my topics, they're, they're two different worlds. You know, one's the, what's the differences and difficulties in pursuing a medical malpractice versus a dental malpractice? It's two different worlds. Um, in, in preparing for this, I was doing some statistical analysis, and what I found out in researching maybe five or six insurance companies, uh, which sort of ruled, ruled the industry, um, it, it was amazing what I, what I found. The willingness is that Medical, it's so much more complex, so much more complex. Um, and a rule of thumb in the medical malpractice area, and we get a lot of calls um, for, you know, hey, so-and-so so was injured, what can we do, how do we do this? And a lot of times we'll refer out those cases because we just won't take medical malpractice cases. Um, and we also get a lot of dental malpractice cases that we get calls on. We refer those out because it's not good for me to take dental malpractice claims or medical. So the willingness is, is that it's a complexity. Um, in, the, in the medical malpractice area, you're talking about unless you are totally disabled or unless you are you know, wrongful death, you generally do not take a medical malpractice claim because it takes thousands of dollars to defend it and also takes thousands of dollars to pursue it. And I've got some statistics that are just beyond, I mean, I was looking at this, I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So... On the, on, the, on the medical side, the average physician, okay, will spend 11% of their career, their 40-year career, 
statistically with an open malpractice claim. That's amazing. That is amazing. And most of the states, a lot of the states have caps, so it's not cost effective to a lot of times pursue these medical malpractice claims. Um, in 2003, there were reported from one particular company 15,000 medical, mal 15, medical malpractice claims. That dropped 40% to 2014 to 8,900. That is a huge, huge drop. So what we're seeing, we're seeing the legislative issues, and we're seeing that lawyers just are not pursuing these cases unless there's a slam dunk. Because it takes, you know, by the time you go through trial, it takes three to four years to get to trial in a medical malpractice claim. And then by the time you get through the appeals and everything else, you could easily have an open case for eight to ten years, literally. Going back and forth, back and forth. Um, and then, interestingly enough, there's only six states in the country that control about 47% of all malpractice cases. Six. Those are New York has 20%. 20% of all malpractice comes out of New York. Um, go figure that, right? Pennsylvania, New Jersey, 15%. Illinois, Massachusetts, and Maryland, 12%. And the rest of the states make up the difference. I mean, six, six states, that's amazing. Then if you look, then with this more research on, on, the, on the dental side, and in my experience, um, dentists are much more likely to settle a case without notifying the medical malpractice carrier. Because, you know, once you get on the databases and once you have the claims, and as a whole, the, medical mal the dental malpractice claims, in relative speaking, are not that expensive. So if you look at all the the malpractice claims that were filed, according to insurance company statistics, 13% were dental. That's it, 13%. It's not a lot. The average claim paid, paid out, is anywhere from twenty-five dollars to $35,000. You know, that's, that's not much. That's not much. And then the average expense runs anywhere from, depending on, on what occurs, $5,000 to $17,000 in expenses. Now, I know on our end, we'll get these calls, hey, Stuart, um, I want to go ahead and get this case settled. Here's my exposure. We'll take a look at it. We'll evaluate it. And our guys on the dental side are much more likely to get a release, pay five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 out of their own pocket and get rid of it um, instead of pursuing a malpractice claim. So your average settlement, statistically, 44% um, are under $10,000. That's it. You're not talking about a lot of money. And most of the cases we get are wrongful extractions. So what's a tooth worth? So then if you drop it down even further, um, you got 32% in between $10,000 and $50,000. Drop it down further, you got 14%, $50,000 to $99,000. If you get to that range, you've, you've done multiple things wrong. You probably pulled a couple wrong teeth. Um, you know, you've probably cut, you know, cut some things you shouldn't have. Um, we've got cases where, you know, implants are going through the jaw. I mean, it's, it's some nasty stuff. The highest rate for problems in our area in dental is surgeons, the surgeons, oral surgeons. Um, and then AIG came out with some statistics in, in, in some of their analysis and, and It'll vary a little bit, but 40% of their malpractice claims were paid in dental. That's a lot. That's a lot. So in our end, what we see is, is that on the medical side, lawyers are just not willing to write letters and send packages on the medical malpractice side because it's so cumbersome. But what we see on the dental side is that we get a lot of one-offs where lawyers say, hey, uh, you had a wrong filling, you pulled the wrong tooth, um, you did this, you did that. Here's our demand. We get much more of those. And then on the, on the dental side, the lawyers that a lot of times will pursue those claims, that's not their area of expertise. They're looking for a one-off hit of 33% or whatever the recovery is. Um, so there's a big, big, huge difference, I think, as far as what's, what's being pursued. Um, you know, then we get to the, the cybersecurity side, and, and, and you know, what's the, you know, why is it, risk of cybersecurity and HIPAA breach more likely to occur in medical uh, instead of dental. It's exposure, it's size, 
its size, the sheer numbers. Dental practices, you know, you're looking at, you know, you got really, you got really three areas. You got the guys who just want to own one practice and they're done. You got guys who want to own multiple practices that are dentists that are practicing. They want to get into the MSO model. And then you've got um, the whole another world where you've got, you know, the corporate dentistry. Um, but most of these, most of the dentists are one-offs. You know, they got six employees, ten employees. They got a hygienist. They got a couple assistants. You know, a couple front desk. And then you got the doc, and maybe you got two docs. So their exposure is not as great as if you got a hospital system, or if you have, you know, dermatology office that has maybe eight or ten offices, maybe 70, 70 100 employees. Um, and I think on the because of that, on the medical side, um, they are, you know, there's there's the word phishing now, which you and I discussed a little mm -hmm. bit where they open up emails, um, or they're you know, spoofing where somebody you know, tags your email and, and sends it out under uh, an assumed name. So your exposure is much, much, much greater um, because of the sheer numbers and the sheer risks involved. Um, dentistry is way behind, way behind, in my opinion, on HIPAA compliance. Way behind, way behind. Um, you know, a lot of our guys, their manuals are not up to date. They have no idea what the compliance is. They're not aware of a lot of the security issues. They're getting there. They're getting there, but they're they're very very vulnerable right now to cyber breaches only because they don't know. And and Debbie mentioned they had a great expression. They put their head in the sand, which is it is. It really is. You know, I'll go to I'll go and talk on these conferences, and I'll mention you know cybersecurity and, and ransomware and all these other things. I have no clue. They just like never heard of that. Never heard of it. But medical, I, I think, is so far ahead in in cybersecurity. Um, but yet, if you look, you know, and, and they also got the biggest risk. If you look under HHS the website, I would say probably 99% of those breaches are um, medical, and it's because of you know some some careless risk management issues. You got you know f you know um, flash drives being left, you got laptops being lost, um, you know you've got emails being opened, you got third-party vendors, third-party vendors are hacking into medical offices. Um, if you go look, if you have nothing else to do, go up to the website, you'll see you've got different varieties of different breaches. So I think cybersecurity, dental has a whole, whole lot. Now what I see is a lot of times is the, I think from a technology standpoint, the younger dentists are, are much more aware, but you had a great point, is they rely on their tech guys too much. Um, but they're, they're, the buzzwords are out there for young guys, we'll talk to dental schools, the, the, and they're, they're, aware, they're aware of the buzzwords where guys have been practicing, you know, 20, 25 years, um, you know, 30 years. Uh, ransomware is, is, is a whole different concept. They've never heard of it. They don't understand it. Um, they don't understand, you know, how you transfer stuff through Bitcoin currency and they release, you know, encrypted software that you can't get in. But medical gets it. I think medical gets it because they have to get it because the fines are so much greater. So, um, but... It's, it's two different worlds in, in medical and our, in our industry, medical and, and dental. So, um, so I uh, yield to my uh, honorable colleague to the left. So, okay. Well, hey, <laughs> th th thank you so much, uh, Stuart and Debbie. Uh, the great information. What we'd like to do is, uh, with the remainder of our panel, our, our uh, doctors and dentists, uh, to uh, talk about their direct application and, and experiences within the, the topics of discussions uh, you know, could be around the patient's uh, care, integrated care, or even to say the technology or liability or legal you know, issues, differences that, they, that were discussed. But uh, what do you feel is, applies to you best that you can speak on? And just uh, if you could each take a turn and discuss those points. Thanks. You want to start over here with me? Right. Sure. Yes. All right. Well, I can talk about a lot of different things. <laughs> uh, so first, Getting um, into the issue of uh, HIPAA, uh, HIPAA is a real pain, but it needs to be there. And only because probably there's a few instances of violations that result in real catastrophic harm, right? You, uh, no one wants your pictures up on the internet, uh, et cetera. Um, the biggest issue is like all of you have clients out there, right? What's your number one communication tool? Email, Email right? All right, so go next week and try to go through a whole week communicating without using email. Right? That's essentially what HIPAA forces us to do. So I get tons of emails. On average, I get about 80 plus a day 
from patients, et cetera, which the reality is HIPAA makes it very difficult for me to communicate. The only way to communicate is via telephone. But as you know, you get on the phone with someone, it, the reason we use email is because we get to control the degree of contact we have. Once you start getting on the phone, each of those calls, you know, instead of being a 30-second uh, response, becomes a five-minute, ten-minute um, uh, call. When you talk about most physicians, dentists, et cetera, reality is we probably have between 1,000 and 1,500 patients in our panels. Um, that becomes, you know, unmanageable on a time uh, basis. So this is where technology really has to come in. So we use an EHR that has a patient portal, et cetera. Um, but even then, to be honest, uh, sometimes you just have to, have to uh, kind of look the other way or, or uh, do what you need to for the sake of the patient. Um, so HIPAA is both a plus and a minus. Um, I'll transition from that into, since this is about integration of dentistry and healthcare, um, I think we all believe that uh, dentists and dental practitioners are part of the healthcare uh, paradigm, right? We all agree that they're care providers. The issue is we don't necessarily treat them appropriately like care providers, right? So uh, one of the things I'd ask you to do is Go find uh, your uh, dentist or dental care provider that you work with or is a client and ask them, like, how many doctors do you know that's on your cell phone, right? So I have neurologists, pulmonologists, I have tons of people on here that when I see someone I, that I'm not sure what to do with, I can call and say, by the way, I have, you know, a 52-year-old gentleman, you know, this is what's going on, at least give me some advice. The reality is the lack of communication is exactly that. It's just lack of communication because we haven't built those bridges. The other issue becomes for most of my care providers that I'm referring out to, I tend to know, as we, I was, we were discussing earlier, who's in network with what plan, only because I have to. I can't send a patient to a neurologist and then the patient comes back and says, well, that neurologist isn't on my insurance plan and you have to send me somewhere else. So what happens is over time, you just kind of develop an understanding of who you can send people to based on their care providers. The problem is dental insurance is kind of all over the place, and so we don't have that same degree of knowledge. So what happens is when I'm trying to refer my patients to dentistry, even though I know a couple of dentists and dental care providers, I don't know what care plans they accept and whether my patient will actually get that care or not, Etc. So I think um, dental providers need to essentially act just like healthcare providers, um, and like most of my healthcare providers will send me something that says, "Hey, by the way, you know these are the services we offer. These are the insurances we um, uh, support," and it goes into kind of our referral binder, so we can always look at it, right? But we don't get that kind of same information uh, uh, from dental care providers. And it's also, I mean, it's a two-way street. Uh, we also just haven't uh, gone out and uh, asked. I live in Gainesville, which is a much smaller community, so it becomes a little bit uh, easier because most care providers are usually the spouse of someone you know uh, in the community. So it, one way or another, you can uh, uh, figure it out and uh, uh, find a uh, person. But I think that's the key in terms of integrating dental practice with healthcare uh, practice. I think um, uh, I have a couple of dentists, and I really like the fact that the number one thing that they can do for me is they actually really get to spend a lot more time with patients probably mm -hmm. than I do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, while they're in the dental chair, people will tell them all sorts of things that they never uh, uh, tell me, you know. Um, uh, but it's, it, it's the way the process happens. You know, medical students often tell me this. They're like, I just spent 45 minutes getting a history on this patient, and then I'll walk in, and in one minute, I'll find something that they didn't tell the student. And the student gets all upset. Like, you know, they just didn't tell me that. And I'm like, that's okay. <laughs> it's not your fault. It's just that people communicate and share different things based on their comfort level uh, with different providers. So um, I think many people have a much better uh, relationship or a different relationship with their dental care provider. And so they will tell you uh, health care facts and so what I often would like to tell my dental care providers is if you hear something that you're not um, satisfied with or that you're worried about relative to their health care, 
pick up the phone. You should have someone that you can call and say, hey, I have this person, you know, can I send them to you or can, can you help me do this? And I think uh, most care providers on the healthcare side would be happy to have that um, uh, call. They'd be uh, happy to see that. And the reason is on the healthcare side, um, I used to have a professor uh, up in Virginia who used to say there's MDs and RDs. And so he's like, RDs are real doctors. Um, and the reality is, uh, I think mo most healthcare practitioners are quite good, but there are a lot that just because of the logistics and the process and the paradigm of the way healthcare is practiced have kind of called it in a little bit. You know, they're kind of going through the motions uh, for the most part. Doesn't mean they're necessarily bad people, but it just means that their patient's health isn't quite optimized as well it, as it should be. And I think other care providers are on the forefront of recognizing that, right? So when you see the person in the dental chair and their blood pressure is out of control and they tell you that their diabetes is out of, you know, um, the reality is either they didn't make an effort to see a healthcare provider because of their philosophical preferences towards healthcare or their healthcare provider didn't do their job appropriately. And that happens. And so you got to identify those people and shuffle them into the system one way or another to someone who's an RD and who's going to take care of them. All right. Thank you, Mo. I with some great insights. Uh, that was really awesome. Uh, so true life application. Uh, next, we're going to go on to Dr. Pam, uh, pediatrician. Uh, eating disorders is her experience and background. Uh, and I know that she... Uh, uh, understands that this to her is second nature to work out uh, with coordinated care with the, uh, the, with a dentist. So, uh, doc, Dr. Pam. All right. Can everyone hear me? So the first thing I would like to say is everyone should keep um, a better track of their PHI, your personal health information, because I forgot to turn in a bio, and somehow Jeff pulled a lot of stuff on me. <laughs> so, be, everyone be careful what's out there on the internet. That sounds like I, a legal problem to me. I don't think, <laughs> I, I don't think he hacked my EMR, but uh, anyway, so, uh, you know, I think the things I have to say probably are a little bit biased. Obviously, I'm a, a pediatrician, so uh, we always say, and I was on my way over here, and I thought, oh my gosh, I didn't even think of anything to say. And uh, I think it's kind of the same thing, like pediatricians always say, well, kids aren't just little adults, right? Like, you really need a specialist, you really need, or someone who's trained in pediatrics. Like, you know, we're not screening for coronary artery disease, you know, and so um, I think it's the same thing. Like, you know, teeth just aren't another bone in your body, right? So it really is important to have, um, you know, dentists involved. I can think of a few instances where, you know, clearly um, communicating with a dentist um, and kind of coordinating care is super important. And um, most of us, you know, if you're practicing with, like, really... Um, cautious, appropriate um, medicine, I feel like collaborating um, with any specialist is the better way to go. Like, I, n I never refer people without calling the specialist to be like, this is what I found, this is why I'm referring them, and this is what I'm concerned about, and, um, or, you know, sending a, a letter or something. Um, so the same thing kind of goes with, with dentists. Um, and so we should be communicating with them, you know, just as well. We have kids who have, you know, heart transplants. We have kids that have, you know, valves that are not their own in their heart. We have kids that um, are living much longer with cancer and are on chemotherapy. And so not only would bacteria in the blood be potentially life-threatening or cause major problems, um, for these kids, but we also have these kids who are immunosuppressed. Um, so there has to be, you know, communication. It's not just like, oh, we're going to go to the dentist. Like, we need to know, are they neutropenic? You know, are, you know do they need um, heart, you know, cardiac prophylaxis, antibiotics before they go? Does this, has this kid been through so many medical procedures that they are going to flip out the second you try and put them in the chair? And maybe you should have, you know, 
talked with the dentist to say, this patient's going to need to be sedated. Like, they can't get a shot without having to take, you know, Valium or something um, because they've had so much, you know, medical stress in their life. Um, so I think from that perspective, that's super important. Um, and then also, you know, as time goes on, there's so much data and there are so many studies in so many different fields. And, you know, there's a lot of things that may come out in dentistry. It doesn't hit the pediatric journal, right? It doesn't, you know, so how am I supposed to know the latest and greatest, you know, of tooth health, you know, without talking to a dentist? And so um, a lot of times, you know, physicians will, you know, once a month have a specialist in to talk to them. And that's how you get that data. I can't read the PEDS journal, the GI journal, the cardiac journal, the dental journal, the orthodontist journal. Like, I can barely keep up with the 18 journals that come every week to my house that are just pediatrics. So, um, and then, you know, on top of that, there's information that although you may be very conscientious and you're trying to keep up um, with the information, um, a lot of times different societies disagree on their, on their protocols. So like the dentistry association and, you know, pediatric dentistry association says, you know, come to the dentist, you know, six months after your first tooth comes through. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics says um, you need a dental home, which could be the pediatrician up until age three. Well, what do you do from age one to age three? Do you send them to the dentist? Do you not? And so how do you kind of, um, you know, reconcile that? And then also know which dentist you'll send them at one, and they'll be like, oh, we don't need to see you until three. And you're like, I'm trying to follow your guidelines, the dentist guidelines. So I think not only knowing your, knowing your local dentist, just like you, you probably wouldn't refer to a cardiologist that you don't know, so, you know, having a pocket full of, um, you know, dentists so that you know how they, how they practice. And, and then on the flip side of that is if there are different recommendations and your local dentist wants you to be the dental home for the first three years, then I would like for that person to tell me exactly what I should be doing since I'm taking on the dental home for two years of this child's life and I'm not a dentist. So it's tricky being a dental home um, when I'm not a dentist. Like, I wouldn't be the cardiac home or the, you know, cancer home. Um, so I think when, when policies are different between societies, like, you have to talk to your local people to find out, like, okay, how are we going to reconcile this? Like, what's a good medium or what, like, you know, what should we be doing? Um, and you know, in our case, you know, we found some good screening questionnaires and we learned a lot about um, risk factors um, for which kids need to go like right at one. And maybe which kids, um, you know, can wait till three. Don't like shake in your boots. <laughs> um, the other thing is, is that um, policies change. So about 10 years ago, the American um, Heart Association changed um, who needed to get cardiac prophylaxis. So probably 15 years ago, it was like, if you even wrote on your health history you need, like, that you had a murmur, the dentist would be calling and be like, I need you to call in amoxicillin. And you're like, no, it's not a concerning murmur. Nope, I'm not touching this kid, you know, kid's mouth. I, they need prophylaxis. And now the American Heart Association has really loosened up um, on, on antibiotic prophylaxis. And I don't know, you know, how does that get from the American Heart Association to the primary, to the dentist, and then they're not sure. And then on top of that, we have some cardiologists who follow the new guidelines and some that don't, and some that still want their kids on antibiotics. And so how is the poor dentist supposed to know like, does the parent know what their cardiologist is wanting? Are they following the new guidelines or are they not? Chances are the primary is going to be kind of that intermediary that can, you know, chit-chat with a dentist um, 
to let them know like, hey, this cardiologist like still wants it, I gave them this medicine, you know, they're good to go. Um, so I think, you know, from an educational perspective um, and as far as um, trying to always uh, coordinate and be practicing the most up-to-date standard of care, which is what we all strive to do, and then also just to not have any miscommunications or bad outcomes because someone didn't know all the information. Um, and beyond that, um, I have lots of dentists on my cell phone because I'm a big believer in phone a friend. If you, like, if my heart rate goes up when a patient comes in, you know when they come in, the tooth is dangling, and I, frankly, I don't really like teeth. Um, <laughs> I don't like looking at them when they're dirty. I don't like them when they're falling out. And it's like, I don't know, do I Google? Do you put it in milk? Do you shove it in and tape some duct tape around there and put them in the car to the dentist if they rip their frenulum, you know? You know, I just always learned in med school, like, oh, well, that's definitely abuse. If frenulum's torn, well, it happens all the time. So you get out into the real world, and then you're like, how do I stop it? You know, there's like saliva and blood, and it's everywhere, and like, I can't stitch that. So, you know, it's, it's good to have some friends that you can phone um, for those mouth uh, problems. And, um, and, and the other, finally, I guess I've... I, I'm a talker, but I just didn't know what I was going to say. Um, so I think the other thing is, is that, you know, as pediatricians, we try so hard to, like, you know, if, even from a young age, you know, to wipe the gums. Like, Mom, please don't put the pacifier in your mouth to clean it off and then give it to your child because now you've just given them all the bacteria in your mouth that are going to cause long-term, you know, caries and that kind of thing. And no, your baby tooth can't just rot out because actually you're rotting out your adult teeth. And, um, you know, people come in and maybe you haven't seen them and they're a year old and you're like, so how's teeth, you know, how's tooth teeth brushing going? And they're like, oh, I have to brush his teeth. You're like, well, they have them. Like, <laughs> don't you think you should clean them? And, but I think when they see, so it's a good reinforcement, right? So they think I'm just crazy and like, okay, so you have to baby proof your house. You have to, you know, those teeth are really close together. Like, I don't care. You're going to have to hold them down and floss them. And they're like a two year old. I'm like, yeah, sorry. Like in between the temper tantrums, yes. And <laughs> then you're also going to have to check your smoke detectors and you need to make sure you're getting all five food groups. I mean, we go, we have to go through a just crazy list of anticipatory guidance. And to have, to have someone reinforce that and take like what is such an important medical problem, clearly, um, Debbie pointed out, um, and really have someone own that. And so they just don't think we're crazy. Because a lot of things we tell parents, they're like, oh yeah, OK, vegetables, yeah, we'll do that every day. But the teeth thing, it you know, it just falls into like every other category, kind of. Like, are you wearing your seatbelt? Yeah. Are you brushing your teeth? Yeah. Are they going to bed? Are you not co-sleeping? But um, you know, it's good to have someone reinforce that, and he can probably explain a lot better why you need to take care of your baby teeth. I just say it's going to rot all the way up into your jaw. <laughs> it's going to be gross, and then I'm not going to want to see it. But um, so. It's good to have a specialist who is reinforcing all of that to parents and giving them that information. So, okay, that's it. That's all I can think of. And, and, you, and you say you didn't know what to talk on. Well, I, I, had, I, I, I had faith in you. So very good to, just to show that it, it starts, uh, it doesn't have to wait till someone's a senior to have coordinated care. It starts, uh, it starts when teeth are actually show up. So there's gr some great information. Thank you so much, Pam. <laughs> Dr. Pam, I want to thank you for your information. I, Dr. Richardson is our periodontist expert, and uh, he's going to have some great information kind of to, to bring it all together as far as the medical and dental side from his experience, and what a great field that uh, he's actually the crossover as a DMD, really. So, um, uh, Dr. Richardson, Hola. please give you some Good morning. Questions. Thank you for having me. Um, how do I follow that up? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> With a lesson, probably. <laughs> well, I, if, you know, in regard to pediatric dentistry, I'm the wrong specialist to be sitting up here. And the average age of my patients is about 70 years older. But, um, but nonetheless, you know, how she was saying, you know, she doesn't like to look at teeth. You know, you, you hear that a lot. Uh, I'm kind of like that when someone walks a five-year-old into my office, I'm like, what am I supposed to do with them? <laughs> you know, um, I, I'm a periodontist, and um, it's probably the least known or least understood specialty in dentistry. Um, I, I'm essentially a gum surgeon and um, do a variety of, of treatments for a variety of things that, that most dentists don't treat. So, um, you know, a trip to my office is usually uh, starts off as an educational uh, lesson because I have to uh, educate every one of my patients of why they've been referred to my office. Um, the types of things that, that I see day to day are, are way more on the medical side than really on the dental side. They affect dental things, teeth primarily. Um, however, I have to kind of find a way to either you know, diagnose a particular issue or um, kind of figure out where we're going to take this. And, and there's so much evidence out there nowadays regarding um, this kind of systemic link between um, inflammation that is caused by the, by the millions and millions of bacteria that live in the mouth and how it affects systemic inflammation and, and the variety of, of systemic conditions. Um, I don't think, and it's inappropriate um, to say, oh, you know, someone with bad teeth is, is going to get cardiovascular disease or is going to get diabetes. But what, what we do know for sure is just clinically it's obvious that folks who have these types of conditions um, in their mouth and also have cardiovascular disease seem to have less control over these issues, diabetics. And, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, inevitably, whenever you get into a conversation with a patient in a dental office about medical things, they kind of clam up a little bit because that's not in their mind why they're there. And, and so they kind of blow me off when I'm asking them about their glycemic control and things like that. And, you know, when I, and I ask them for their physician's name because even though there's a line for it on my medical history, they didn't write it in there. You know, they don't want me calling them. All they want is their teeth to, tooth to be fixed, you know. Uh, so those are some of the challenges um, I face as a periodontist. Gosh, the, there's so much, so many things that I could talk about at this point based upon what we've heard already. Um, we could sit here until January and go through it. Um, but I guess primarily um, one of the things that I think it's important to address is that, you know, I, I, being a specialist, I get all of my patient referrals from other dentists. So I get to see kind of everybody's work in comparison and in, and, and I guess what I would say is that not all dental offices are, are, are the same, you know. So to think that, you know, every dentist isn't practicing the same level of dentistry. And, and, that's, and that's a problem with dentistry. It's a problem with dental school education from the perspective that we're not taught to communicate with physicians. We're taught to take medical histories. And, and the key topics, the key things that affect what we want to do and, and the things that we could do to potentially mess up something that they've got going on. Um, in my mind, and as I've learned through residency and now through you know, the last seven years in practice, uh, is that it's so much more than that. And if you take a special interest in their medical care, in their um, just day-to-day -day life, um, your treatments are, uh, are more successful primarily because you've been able to mentally prepare them for what to expect when they're doing these procedures. Um, the, the worst thing you can do is do something on a patient who doesn't know why they're sitting there, and you do something and they don't know what to expect, and then they get a result that somehow surprises them, and you haven't informed them of that's the potential issue that could, could occur. Um, then there's a lot of complications, whether it, it ends up in Mr. Oberman's office or, or wherever, you know, uh, we, we try really hard to just educate. And I think that's the most, most important thing here. Um, we as dentists, uh, you know, to a certain degree are always a little bit insecure in regard to, and I think it's the culture of dentistry. It's the, you know, it's, it's watching a sitcom on TV and, and it's hearing that, you know, the dentist on the show wasn't smart enough to get into medical school and that's why they're a dentist, you know, things like that. And, and I think there's this ingrained insecurity that we don't, we, we're worried about calling a medical office and, and, and 
you're wasting the physician's time or asking something that they may consider as a stupid question or something like that. I, I hate that that security insecurity exists, but it does. Now, I, I don't really have the, uh, I, don't, I have to call. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, I'm doing more invasive things on folks that involves a substantial amount of bleeding, a substantial amount of, uh, of, of healing, um, and things like that. So I, I reach out to some of the dentists that I, that I work with routinely, and, you know, and if they're going to do uh, things in their office uh, similar or in the same ballpark of things that I would do in my office, which is now becoming the trend in dentistry, um, th then I have to encourage them also to act like you're a specialist and take the necessary steps. Now, what I'm alluding to essentially is that in dentistry we have very little regulation regarding what dentists are allowed to do in relationship to what specialists normally do. Um, it, it, 30 years ago there were distinct dental specialties that, that were, you know, were referred to to do various procedures that were out of the realm of general dentistry and that specialists went to additional schooling to learn how to do properly. Um, nowadays, dentistry is in this flux. It's in this transition where, um, where dentists are seeking out additional courses and things. I mean, we've got dentists doing Botox and dermal fillers and We've got dentists doing, you know, dental implants who have never had surgical training other than removing teeth. Um, you know, and, and, I, and the strange thing about it is, is that, I mean, I have general friend, dental dentist friends who place implants, and they're as good as I am. They're amazing. But um, it, it's not all created equal. You can currently take a cruise to Cancun and learn to place implants on a cadaver and place them on Monday morning. And there's no regulation to this at all. The only statute in the Florida statutes is simply that you have to perform it to the level of the specialist. But who's to say what that is? And the person has to know to be able to transition that to the board of dentistry or whatever. But even so, it is going on at a rampant pace. And so it, I, I would say dentists are um, distancing this gap between dentists um, and medicine. Um, as much as any of the physicians are. I mean, I, I think the physicians are just waiting for us to reach out and, and would be happy. And that's been my experience with communicating with physicians. Um, if I, you know, if I have a patient, um, you know, with a bleeding disorder, I mean, uh, I reach out because <laughs> I'm not touching that patient until I know for sure what the, what the plan is. I mean, uh, I, I, have, I have a physician patient with, with von Willenbrand's disease, and i I've never treated a patient with von Willenbrand's disease, so I reached out for education, and 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 it's gone smoothly. It's it's gone wonderfully, and so um, you know I'm always kind of unclear what's going to come out of my mouth when I start talking about these things because I'm very passionate about a lot of this stuff, and I I hold my colleagues to very high standards, and so um, I, I've made an effort to reach out to them and, and say, listen, you know, because a lot of the specialists will really look down upon the general dentists who are seeking out, um, you know, to learn to do other types of things. And, um, and I think that that's the wrong approach. I think the approach is, listen, you know, if you're going to be touching people, you need to know what you, you need to be doing and, and you need to know who to reach out to in case you have questions about that. And it, it just comes from so many different avenues. I mean, one, taking a proper medical history so that you know beforehand what the potential issues are to being able to interpret that medical history. I mean, if, you know, dentistry in the early 2000s took this turn towards cosmetics and every family dentist in the country became a cosmetic dentist. And, and patients walk in and ask if you're a cosmetic dentist as opposed to a general dentist and they're one and the same. And, um, you know, it, it just, it became, dentistry went into this field of tooth whitening and, and, and things that that take dentistry away from oral medicine and, and more towards cosmetology, if you will. I don't know, that may be a bad example, but um, I, it became very apparent to me in about, you know, about a year of dental school that I didn't want to be a, a hairdresser for teeth, you know, uh, that just wasn't my thing. And, and, and I'm glad that there are people who will do that because I don't have to, that's great. Um, but I, you know, I, I still encourage that, you know, that teeth are part of the mouth, the mouth is part of the body, and the mouth is probably the single greater, the greatest polluter of the bloodstream of bacteria. And, you know, if you have to wear two masks to be near that patient, 
then I, you know I would suggest that probably we need to get their their the oral condition uh, in shape. Um, I think I should t stop talking at this point. <laughs> well, I got you know I, I got a comment. What you said is about I think you're right that that physicians are more out to reach out than dentists are to reach out to physicians. And there's sort of a the sort of a, the sort of thing within the industry is that medical school breeds colleagues, dental school breeds competitors. And there's a huge difference, and I think the, the medical profession is more collegial um, than the dental profession, because these guys are so isolated that they don't reach out. And that has, that's, that's a problem with our clients, they don't, you know, a lot of times they don't reach out. So I, I totally agree with that. Wow. Again, again, some great information. Thank you, Doc, Dr. Richardson, so much. Uh, uh, what, before we go into questions, and I'm sure you all have a lot of questions, I want to recognize our uh, attending healthcare organization partners are here uh, and want to thank them for showing up and caring en enough to wanting to know more. From the Dental Society of uh, Greater Orlando, we have uh, Sharon Hamilton and, Kel and Kelly Milet. Could you please st stand up? Thank you. Thank you. Again, thank you so much for, for being here. Um, from Orange County Medical Society, Marty Melton, who's in her new position. Thank you. thank you so much for being here. And from the Central Florida MGMA, Celia, Celia Myers, who is a past president. So uh, again, thank you. Thank you uh, for attending. Uh, thank you for understanding the, the importance of this topic. Uh, and uh, hopefully you all have some good questions to, to add. So. What we want to go in, and again, this is something we want to show to the students and make available because of how important it is, and that's where it really needs to start the education, right? So through our HELPS program and, and educating them on the things that they haven't or should be educated on but don't, uh, please participate. So we're going to go into questions right now. Uh, please uh, raise your hand if you've got a question. And Okay. All right, Celia. Celia? Um, this is to the physicians mostly, but in your training, the dentists and the doctors, when you were in training, did you, was there any mention of consideration of, across the road, the dentists of the medical side and the doctors of the oral health side? And um, do you know if there's anything in the current education of physicians and dentists encouraging them to cross over? Because I, Dr. Richardson, to, today was the first time I ever heard the term oral medicine. I've heard oral health, but I and I've worked for physicians for 25 years or more, and you, there's never a question on the intake uh, form about, you know, there's do you do you eat regularly and that kind of thing. And if the, it's no, it, there's never a pursuit down that. Um, in my in my world, oral medicine primarily refers to um, types of things that go on in the mouth beyond uh, dental cavities. I, I think, um, it, although I think it's probably included, but more like oral cancer, um, various um, tissue lesions, and things like that. There, there, there's a specific field of dentistry that's referred to as oral medicine, but um, and and I think that you know periodontics falls into that. To that category, but thank you for bringing that up. It's important to me. Um, in regard to your question of the integrating medicine and dentistry uh, at an educational level, um, the, there are multiple programs because um, at the University of Florida, medicine and dentistry are in the same building vir virtually. Um, there are some programs that are designed to match up dental students and medical students, and then they're assigned. Um, patients who qualify for a program out in the community and they reach out and they go out to the patients homes and they do home care visits and, and it's just to kind of it's, it's a really nice program it started right around the time I was in school and and still goes to my you know, to my knowledge it's, it's a pretty good program and I would answer that um, uh, to echo what dr. Richardson say but I, I think education is severely lacking so um, at my previous university, I was chairman of the student uh, curriculum committee. So I can tell you from the medical student side, because I helped develop the entire curriculum, we had zero lectures regarding oral health and oral medicine in the medical school side, uh, except for the fact relating to the guidelines for uh, perhaps antibiotic use or treating bleeding diathesis prior to uh, 
uh, any type of surgery, not just uh, oral surgery. But other than those, those are probably the only two questions I can think of even on the board exams from the medicine side that kind of pertain to oral health. So it's an area that's severely lacking, um, at least from the medicine standpoint. All right. Thank you very much. We have another question. Um, for the benefit of the patients in the room, we, I'm sure we all know that our healthcare professionals are under a lot of pressure with regulation and revenue. What can we do? Can we become more educated? Can that help your education? Can we start to build that bridge for you? Um, yes. <laughs> no. So, um, short, succinct answer. I love it. My favorite patient is the well educated patient in terms of educated about their health care. So, when they come to me and they have a list of their specialists, their phone numbers, faxes, a list of their medications, et cetera, that saves me a huge headache, number one. Number two, that's a person who I'm sure is pretty much compliant with my recommendations, guidelines, et cetera. It saves me a lot from the back end standpoint of trying to find those appropriate people, the contact information, et cetera. So, Having a individual who's educated about their health is um, vital. I do a lot of uh, medical outreach. I run um, medical mission trips uh, through the University of Florida to Ecuador. I'm from India. I do medical outreach trips there. So one of the interesting things about um, the third world, uh, they don't use EHRs, right? So interesting enough, patients are responsible for their own medical records. So when I see a patient in India, they actually come with a binder. And I essentially put another piece of paper on top of that binder with my notes on it and what I'm doing, and then I hand it back to the patient. I don't document it anywhere. The patient is then responsible for their own medical record that they carry around to them. So if they go see someone else, they just bring that binder and it allows me to quickly browse through there and see what's going on. It's a very different uh, uh, model, but one that um, relies on patient accountability and patient responsibility, and in many ways it works a lot better than our current model here. Interesting. On that note, can I add something? That was the purpose or one of the goals of meaningful use is to make the patient more accountable and more responsible for their own health care. So that's the, the area or the goal of the meaningful use um, track. Good morning. I'm Tina with Right at Home. We're an in-home care agency. So my question is, how can dental practices participate in the medical home model and do dentists ever refer in-home care for their patients? I guess that question is directed towards me. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, that's okay. Uh, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I do know of a couple of dentists who actually do participate in, in, in home care dentistry. Um, there's uh, a, they have kind of a mobile unit, if you will, um, but I don't know that it's that the, the really the opportunities are out there that dentists know about. I, I think that some education towards dental medicine regarding what the opportunities are and what it would entail. I mean, obviously we we worry about not having our things and not having you know what we're used to practicing dentistry. If if any you know when you go on like a mission trip uh, to Ecuador and you're practicing dentistry in a lawn chair. It's, it's, it's a little bit, you know, and obviously that's an extreme example, but, but coming into a home where, where you don't know what you have and you don't know what you're going to see when you get there and that sort of thing, a little bit uh, intimidating, I think, for some dentists. But I think that um, if I think if, the, if, the, if there were some educational material that, that, um, that educated uh, dental medicine, maybe at the dental society level or, or something like that, that uh, of what the opportunities are there um, and, and how, how dentists could help. I think there are a lot of dentists who want to help and just don't really know exactly where to go to provide that help. All right. Thank you for that question. We have one, one more question. Hi, I'm Greg Stewart. I'm the uh, Chief Dental Officer with Community Health Centers here in the uh, Central Florida area. I have a couple of questions. Very quickly, though, um, in referrals between dentists and uh, medical providers, I have found that uh, many of the managed care plans 
are dictating that you refer the patient back to the plan so they then will refer to the uh, their physician of choice. Do you have any experience with that? Is, is there any solution to that? Because I personally am uncomfortable having somebody else refer my patient for care and me not knowing anything about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it sucks. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll drink to that. Right. Sec uh, second question I had was uh, concerning HIPAA uh, violations. Have you seen any uh, particular area within the dental practices that are leading in you know, any one particular reason that would cause a HIPAA violation? Um, yes, actually. Um, the biggest area that in dentistry that is lacking is the need for a, a risk assessment uh, or risk analysis. Um, because when you do a risk analysis, you're going out and you're looking at the entire practice to determine where there's possible um, areas for breaches. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, we were talking earlier, there was a practice in um, King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, that was cyberly hacked last week. So, I mean, it does happen in the, dental, in the dentistry air arena. The thing to remember is the medical record is more valuable than your financial record where your financial record is worth 50 cents, your medical record's worth 100 bucks on the black market. And they don't really know the difference between a dental office or a medical office. So I think the biggest area that, um, that we're seeing the lacking and the biggest area that the OCR is coming down on is the lack of risk assessments and, or risk analysis. Thank you. We're gonna sneak Thank in one more much. question from Ken Peach. Good morning, Ken Peach from the Health Council of East Central Florida. Um, we have operating in the four counties around here uh, basically collaborations between medical services, uh, public health, hospitals, uh, physicians, health plans, and others. Um, what is it that we can do in each of these counties to facilitate the goal, which is stated very clearly, particularly in Brevard County, to bring medical services, behavioral health, and those two are coming together a lot closer, and the oral health piece together under one umbrella. Is there anything we can do to facilitate that interaction that you've been talking about this morning? Um, I would say, uh, uh, for example, there's something called the uh, North Florida Healthcare Guide, which is essentially a list of physicians and their specialties locally um, with all their contact information. Um, I don't know if anyone is publishing something similar with uh, dentists and oral healthcare uh, providers. It'd be nice just to have access to a database that has who everyone is. Um, I live in Gainesville, like I said, which is a pretty small place, so you get to know everyone. But um, not being familiar with this, just driving down Maitland Avenue, I mean, the, I, I see tons of care providers, both from the healthcare standpoint and the dental standpoint, and I don't know how they're bridging that gap. So having some type of uh, database, even if it's just a manual or a, uh, 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 you know, uh, guide that gives you that basic information would be helpful. I, I think that kind of, you know, probably falls into the medical home too. Um, if you're certified as a medical home, like you have someone to call and see if people have missed appointments, reschedule them, make sure that they've made, you know, referrals. And if we all were rich enough to be able to have a social worker or someone who had a list of providers could call and make appointments, knew what insurances, you know, were covered, then definitely behavioral health and dentistry could fall into that. Um, the reality is, is that unless you work in a, a large practice or a hospital-based practice or a CHC where everything's in one uh, building, you know, a lot of us can't necessarily, um, uh, it's not feasible to have staff just to do that. But that is the idea of the medical home, really. So, and, you know, to add dentistry and behavioral health seems obvious because those are probably two of the areas where patients have the hardest time um, finding providers on their network plan um, and within an hour of their home. You know, you mentioned insurance, and that's a great point. It is the dental industry is very interesting in that the, the, the younger dentists that are starting out They've got to go on these insurance plans to survive. They've got to do it. Um, you've got the more established dentists that will not touch an insurance plan. 
They, go, they will not go on these plans. They will go kicking and screaming. Um, they will not do anything in relation to insurance. A lot of these guys are fee for service, and it's, if you don't pay cash, you're done. But there's a big difference in discrepancy in insurance and what's going on in, in the industry. Um, but I think uh, you, you may know more about this than I do internally, but the dental industry is going into the insurance side kicking and screaming. Uh, they will not, they don't want it, they don't like it, they want nothing to do with it. Um, so it's, the, it's interesting. The first thing to remember is dental insurance is not dental insurance. It is a benefit that your employer graciously gives to you because you do such a great job that you actually do actually have to pay for it. So because you get a $2,000 window a year, that's one root canal or one crown or one, one quad of osteosurgery. It hasn't changed since 1960. But something to keep in mind where the medical, and we, I've seen, personally, I've seen this um, happen, where if you can prove that it's medically necessary for someone to go to a dentist, there's a, there's a and the uh, medical coders in the room can maybe help with this a little better. There's a thing called gap insurance in your health care um, uh, insurance, which is true insurance, not just a benefit. And if you can prove that there's nobody else in the area that can provide this service, that gap insurance will, will kick in. So obviously from a medical standpoint, there's nobody else in the medical field that can do osteosurgery except for a periodontist. So you can use that gap um, clause to send to a periodontist, if that makes sense. And like I said, maybe a medical coder in the room could help with that a lot better. But that's an option to look at. But m dental insurance is far different from medical insurance. So I don't even use the word insurance in the dental office. All right. Well, we want to thank you all for some great questions. We want to thank our panel for an awesome job today on a, on a great topic and uh, launching us into the uh, dental space uh, in the idea of holi holistic treatment of a patient. And that spoke of a wheel from the wheel of uh, physicians, dentists, opticians and even mental health uh, ideally are the uh, combined care that a patient needs. So thank you all for being here. I appreciate your questions. The, the discussion will continue on LinkedIn. Look for that. Participate. And again, this is all a, a great value education that we're going to be giving to our healthcare students.